Robert Louis Stevenson, Some Portraits by Rayburn, narrated by Stephen Rees. Through the initiative of a prominent citizen, Edinburgh has been in possession for some autumn weeks of a gallery of paintings of singular merit and interest. They were exposed in the apartments of the Scotch Academy and filled those who are accustomed to visit the annual spring exhibition with astonishment and a sense of incongruity. Instead of the two common purple sunsets and pea-green fields and distances executed in putty and hog's lard, he beheld, looking down upon him from the walls of room after room, a whole army of wise, grave, humorous, capable or beautiful countenances, painted simply and strongly by a man of genuine instinct. It was a complete act of the human drawing-room comedy, lords and ladies, soldiers and doctors, hanging judges and heretical divines, a whole generation of good society was resuscitated, and the Scotchman of today walked about among the Scotchmen of two generations ago. The moment was well chosen, neither too late nor too early. The people who sat for these pictures are not yet ancestors, they are still relations. They are not yet altogether part of the dusty past, but occupy a middle distance within cry of our affections. The little child who looks wonderingly on his grandfather's watch in the picture is now the veteran sheriff emeritus of Perth. And I hear a story of a lady who returned the other day to Edinburgh after an absence of sixty years. I could see none of my old friends, she said, until I went into the Rayburn Gallery and found them all there. It would be difficult to say whether the collection was more interesting on the score of unity or diversity. Where the portraits were all of the same period, almost all of the same race, and all from the same brush, there could not fail to be many points of similarity. And yet the similarity of the handling seems to throw into more vigorous relief those personal distinctions which Rayburn was so quick to seize. He was a born painter of portraits. He looked people shrewdly between the eyes, surprised their manners in their face, and had possessed himself of what was essential in their character before they had been many minutes in his studio. What he was so swift to perceive, he conveyed to the canvas almost in the moment of conception. He had never any difficulty, he said, about either hands or faces, about draperies or light or composition. He might see room for hesitation or afterthought, but a face or a hand was something plain and legible. There were no two ways about it, any more than about the person's name. And so each of his portraits are not only, in Dr. Johnson's phrase aptly quoted on the catalogue, a piece of history, but a piece of biography into the bargain. It is devoutly to be wished that all biography were equally amusing, and carried its own credentials equally upon its face. These portraits are racier than many anecdotes, and more complete than many a volume of sententious memoirs. You can see whether you get a stronger and clearer idea of Robertson the historian from Rayburn's palette or Dougal Stewart's woolly and evasive periods, and then the portraits are both signed and countersigned, for you have first the authority of the artist, whom you recognise as no mean critic of the looks and manners of men. And next, you have the tacit acquiescence of the subject, who sits looking out upon you with inimitable innocence, and apparently under the impression that he is in a room by himself. For Rayburn could plunge at once through all the constraint and embarrassment of the sitter, and present the face clear, open, and intelligent as at the most disengaged moments. This is the best scene in portraits, where the sitter is represented in some appropriate action. Neil Gow with his fiddle, Dr. Spence shooting an arrow, or Lord Bannantyne hearing a cause. Above all, from this point of view, the portrait of Lieutenant Colonel Leon is notable. A strange enough young man, pink, fat about the lower part of the face, with a lean forehead, and a narrow nose and a fine nostril, sits with a drawing-board upon his knees. He has just paused to render himself account of some difficulty, to disentangle some complication of line or compare neighbouring values. And there, without any perceptible wrinkling, you have rendered for you exactly the fixed look in the eyes and the unconscious compression of the mouth that befit and signify an effort of the kind. The whole pose, the whole expression, 
is absolutely direct and simple. You are ready to take your oath to it that Colonel Leon had no idea he was sitting for his picture, and thought of nothing in the world besides his own occupation of the moment. Although the collection did not embrace, I understand, nearly the whole of Rayburn's works, it was too large not to contain some that were indifferent, whether as works of art or as portraits. Certainly, the standard was remarkably high, and was wonderfully maintained, but there were one or two pictures that might have been almost as well away, one or two that seemed wanting in salt, and some that you can only hope were not successful likenesses. Neither of the portraits of Sir Walter Scott, for instance, were very agreeable to look upon. You do not care to think that Scott looked quite so rustic and puffy. And where is that peaked forehead which, according to all written accounts and many portraits, was the distinguishing characteristic of his face? Again, in spite of his own satisfaction, and in spite of Dr. John Brown, I cannot consider that Rayburn was very happy in hands. Without doubt, he could paint one if he had taken the trouble to study it, but it was by no means always that he gave himself the trouble. Looking round one of these rooms hang about with his portraits, you were struck with the array of expressive faces, as compared with what you might have seen in looking round a room full of living people. But it was not so with the hands. The portraits differed from each other in face perhaps ten times as much as they differed by the hand, whereas with living people the two go pretty much together, and where one is remarkable the other will almost certainly not be commonplace. One interesting portrait was that of Duncan of Camperdown. He stands in uniform beside a table, his feet slightly straddled with the balance of an old sailor, his hand poised upon a chart by the fingertips. The mouth is pursed, the nostrils spread and drawn up, the eyebrows very highly arched. The cheeks lie along the jaw in folds of iron and have the redness that comes from much exposure to salt sea winds. From the whole figure, attitude and countenance there breathes something precise and decisive, something alert, wiry and strong. You can understand from the look of him that sense not so much of humour as of what is grimmest and driest in pleasantry, which inspired his address before the fight at Camperdown. He had just overtaken the Dutch fleet under Admiral de Winter. Gentlemen, says he, you see a severe winter approaching. I have only to advise you to keep up a good fire. Somewhat of this same spirit of adamant and drollery must have supported him in the days of the mutiny at the Nore, when he lay off the Texel with his own flagship, the Venerable, and only one other vessel, and kept up active signals as though he had a powerful fleet in the offing to intimidate the Dutch. Another portrait which irresistibly attracted the eye was the half-length of Robert McQueen of Braxfield, Lord Justice Clerk. If I know gusto in painting when I see it, this canvas was painted with rare enjoyment, the tart, rosy, humorous look of the man, his nose like a cudgel, his face resting squarely on the jowl, has been caught and perpetuated with something that looks like brotherly love. A peculiarly subtle expression haunts the lower part, sensual and incredulous, like that of a man tasting good Bordeaux with half a fancy it has been somewhat too long and corked. From under the pendulous eyes of old age, the eyes look out with a half-youthful, half-frosty twinkle. Hands with no pretense to distinction are folded on the judge's stomach. So sympathetically is the character conceived by the portrait painter that it is hardly possible to avoid some movement of sympathy on the part of the spectator. And sympathy is a thing to be encouraged, apart from humane considerations, because it supplies us with the materials for wisdom. It is probably more instructive to entertain a sneaking kindness for any unpopular person, and, among the rest, for Lord Braxfield, than to give way to perfect raptures of moral indignation against his abstract vices. He was the last judge on the Scotch bench to employ the pure Scotch idiom. His opinions, thus given in Doric, and conceived in a lively, rugged, conversational style, were full of point and authority. Out of the bar or off the bench, he was a convivial man, a lover of wine, and one who shone peculiarly at tavern meetings. He has left behind him an unrivalled reputation for rough and cruel speech, and to this day his name smacks of the gallows. 
It was he who presided over the trials of Muir and Skirving in 1793 and 1794, and his appearance on these occasions was scarcely cut to the pattern of today. His summing up on Muir began thus. The reader must supply for himself the growling blacksmith's voice and the broad Scotch accent. No, this is the question for consideration. Is the panel guilty of sedition, or is he not? Now, before this can be answered, two things must be attended to that require no proof. First, that the British Constitution is the best that ever was since the creation of the world, and it is not possible to make it better. It's a pretty fair start, is it not, for a political trial? A little later, he has occasion to refer to the relations of Muir with those wretches, the French. I never liked the French all my days, said his lordship, but now I hate them. And yet a little further on, a government in country should be like a corporation, and in this country it is made up of the landed interest, which alone has a right to be represented. As for the rabble who have nothing but personal property, what hold has the nation of them? They may pack up their property on their backs and leave the country in the twinkling of an eye. After having made profession of sentiments so cynically anti-popular as these, when the trials were at an end, which was generally about midnight, Braxfield would walk home to his house in George Square with no better escort than an easy conscience. I think I see him getting his cloak about his shoulders and, with perhaps a lantern in one hand, steering his way along the streets in the murk January night. It might have been that very day that Skirving had defied him in these words, It is altogether unavailing for your lordship to menace me, for I have long learned to fear not the face of man, and I can fancy as Braxfield reflected on the number of what he called Grumbletonians in Edinburgh, and of how many of them must bear special malice against so uptight and inflexible a judge, nay, and might at that very moment be lurking in the mouth of a dark close with hostile intent. I can fancy that he indulged in a sour smile, as he reflected that he also was not especially afraid of men's faces or men's fists, and had hitherto found no occasion to embody this insensibility in heroic words. For if he was an inhumane old gentleman, and I am afraid it is a fact that he was inhumane, he was also perfectly intrepid. You may look into the queer face of that portrait for as long as you will, but you will not see any hole or corner for timidity to enter in. Indeed, there would be no end to this paper if I were even to name half of the portraits that were remarkable for their execution or interesting by association. There was one picture of Mr. Wardrop of Torbane Hill, which you might palm off upon most laymen as a Rembrandt, and close by you saw the white head of John Clark of Eldin, that country gentleman who, playing with pieces of cork on his own dining table, invented modern naval warfare. There was the portrait of Neil Gow, to sit for which the old fiddler walked daily through the streets of Edinburgh, arm in arm with the Duke of Athol. There was good Harry Erskine, with his satirical nose and upper lip, and his mouth just open for a witticism to pop out. Hutton, the geologist, in Quakerish raiment, and looking altogether trim and narrow. And as if he cared more about fossils than young ladies, full-blown John Robison, in hyperbolic red dressing-gown, and every inch of him a fine old man of the world, constable the publisher, upright beside a table, and bearing a corporation with commercial dignity. Lord Bannatyne, hearing a cause, if ever anybody heard a cause since the world began. Lord Newton, just awakened from clandestine slumber on the bench. And the second president, Dundas, with every feature so fat that he reminds you in his wig of some droll old court officer in an illustrated nursery storybook. And yet, of all these fat features instinct with meaning, the fat lips curved and compressed, the nose combining somehow the dignity of a beak with the good nature of a bottle, and the very double chin with an air of intelligence and insight. And all these portraits are so pat and telling, and look at you so spiritedly from the walls, that compared with the sort of living people one sees about the streets, they are as bright new sovereigns to fishy and obliterated sixpences. Some disparaging thoughts upon our own generation could hardly fail to present themselves. 
but it is perhaps only the Sassavatis who is wanting, and we also, painted by such a man as Carolus Duran, may look in holiday immortality upon our children and grandchildren. Rayburn's young women, to be frank, are by no means of the same order of merit. No one, of course, could be insensible to the presence of Miss Janet Sutty or Mrs. Campbell of Possil. When things are as pretty as that, criticism is out of season. But on the whole, it is only with women of a certain age that he can be said to have succeeded, in at all the same sense as we say he succeeded with men. The younger women do not seem to be made of good flesh and blood. They are not painted in rich, unctuous touches. They are dry and diaphanous. And although young ladies in Great Britain are all that can be desired of them, I would fain hope that they are not quite so much of that as Rayburn would have us believe. In all these pretty faces you miss character, you miss fire, you miss that spice of the devil which is worth all the prettiness in the world. And what is worst of all, you miss sex. His young ladies are not womanly to nearly the same degree as his men are masculine. They are so in a negative sense, in short, they are the typical young ladies of the male novelist. To say truth, either Rabin was timid with young and pretty sitters, or he had stupefied himself with sentimentalities, or else, and here is about the truth of it, Rayburn and the rest of his labour under an obstinate blindness in one direction, and know very little more about women after all these centuries than Adam when he first saw Eve. This is all the more likely, because we are by no means so unintelligent in the matter of old women. There are some capital old women, it seems to me, in books written by men, and Rayburn has some, such as Mrs. Colin Campbell of Park, or the anonymous old lady with a large cap, which are done in the same frank, perspicacious spirit as the very best of his men. He could look into their eyes without trouble, and he was not withheld by any bashful sentimentalism from recognising what he saw there and unsparingly put it down upon the canvas. But where people cannot meet without some confusion and a good deal of involuntary humbug and are occupied for as long as they are together with a very different vein of thought, there cannot be much room for intelligent study, nor much result in the shape of genuine comprehension. Even women who understand men so well for practical purposes do not know them well enough for the purposes of art. Take even the very best of their male creations. Take Tito Melema, for instance, and you will find he has an unequivocal air, and every now and again remembers he has a comb at the back of his head. Of course, no woman will believe this, and many men will be so very polite as to humour their incredulity.'